This is the 12th in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture we'll talk about permuting the roots of a polynomial. We work over any field. What we're wondering is how the coefficients relate to the roots. As a simple example, let's say over the rationals, we could look at um, constructing a quadratic polynomial with roots x is 3 and x is 7. Um, in order to do that, we'd have to have uh, x minus 3 and x minus 7 as factors. And to make a quadratic, when you already have two linear factors, that's already degree 2, uh, that's all you could do. So it's just going to be a uh, multiple of x minus a um, constant multiple, non-zero constant, x minus 3, x minus 7. Um, so if we expand that out, we'll get that multiple times x squared minus 3 plus 7x plus 3 times 7. And that's the only uh, quadratic we could have. Remember that a monic uh, polynomial means one with the leading coefficient equal to 1. So if we make that monic, um, then it's uniquely determined that it has to be the unique polynomial with these two roots, the unique quadratic with these two roots, is uh, x squared minus 3 plus 7x plus 3 times 7. Of course, we can always make anything monic by dividing off the whatever the leading coefficient is. If we had some polynomial, say, as an example, say 3x squared minus 4x plus 1, we could always divide by 3, and over any field we can always divide by whatever the leading coefficient is. Um, so uh, as long as it's a non-zero leading coefficient, we can we can divide it off and get uh, one third. Um, so we get uh, a, a, a monic polynomial with the same roots. Using exactly the same idea, we can ask what if we wanted the roots not to be three and seven, but what if we wanted them to be um, x equals some number, let's say r, and x equals some other number s. Um, or over an arbitrary field, we could ask for roots r and s in a quadratic polynomial, monic quadratic. And of course, it would have to be this guy, x minus r, x minus s. And if we expand that out, we get x squared minus r plus s x plus r s. So we're beginning to see some kind of expression in terms of the roots. How do we calculate the coefficients in terms of the roots? The same idea would work if we wanted three roots, a cubic with three different roots. We had r, s, and t. Um, then we could simply uh, multiply the linear factors together and expand out. And we get x cubed minus r plus s plus tx plus rs plus rt plus st x squared and then minus rst. And we start to see some sort of a pattern here. Uh, the first thing we see as our pattern is that these, co these coefficients here, we've got, um, well, we've got a coefficient of 1 because it's a monic polynomial. Then we've got, ignoring the plus and minus signs, which are, which are in here somewhere, just forget the plus and minus signs for the moment. You can see that's r plus s plus t. And this is rs plus rt plus st. And then this is rst. So we begin to see a pattern. These are the sums of products of, um, of different pairs or different triples, single, triple, double, triple choices. Um, so we take all possible, product, all possible products of one at a time, all possible products of two at a time, all possible products of three at a time. Um, they have to be three different ones. We don't get r squared s. We don't do the same thing twice. So we pick the diff different roots and we multiply them, some number of them, one of them, two of them, three of them, together in all possible ways. The, the plus and minus signs also aren't so hard. There's a plus, minus, plus, minus. So you can just see that the, they turn on and off like, like a light switch. So that's a very simple rule. So we can give this a name. Um, this is, uh, the name is a bit tricky. Um, it's uh, due to someone known either as Vieta, or um, so this is Vieta's formula, uh, also called Viet, and uh, I have no idea how his name was originally pronounced. Um, I believe he's from uh, somewhere around uh, the former Yugoslavia. Um, 
amphimonic uh, polynomial in one variable splits into factors. It's x minus root 1, x minus root 2, da 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 da, da x minus some root. Um, then, uh, of course, r1 to rn, those numbers that are in here, are the roots. And, um, and the coefficients, the coefficients are, um, well, we're going to get um, various products. Um, so p of x is going to be x to the n minus a1 x to the n minus 1 plus a2 x to the n minus 2 plus, well, minus da 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 and there'll be some plus or some minus a n minus 1 x and then a plus or a minus a n. Um, and so we can we can see that though, ignoring the plus and minus signs, um, let's just see what the a's are. Where a1 is the sum of the roots r1 plus r2 plus dot 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 plus rn. a2 is the sum of products ri, rj, i less than j. I'm picking it less than j so it never never overlap and I don't put the same product down twice. And then um, a3 is the sum i less than j less than k, ri, rj, rk, triple products, and we make sure they're all different products by making sure we don't, don't repeat. Um, we can always sort them into order, i less than j less than k, um, and so on and so forth. So a, this is a bit trickier when you try and write down what's a i, the i term, um, it's going to be a sum let's say j1 less than j2 less than dot 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 less than ji, a sum over all possible choices of, of that many indices, i indices, um, in, in, an or, in order, are j1 dot 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 uh, rji, and so on and so forth. And then finally, a n minus 1 is going to be, um, you'd have r1, r2, da 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 rn, but cross out the r1, r1, r2, da 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 da, Sorry, dot times uh, times da, 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 r n cross with r two plus dot 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 da, da, all the way down um, to r one r two dot dot da, da, cross out the r n and then finally a n is r one dot 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 r n all of them multiplied together. Let's repeat the same the same story, but now we'll make make abstract variables for the in place of the roots. So the um, elementary symmetric polynomials. So these are the following. Um, uh, are the polynomials traditionally written as e1, e2, dot, 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 en of variables. And we'll write our variables as t1, dot, 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 tn, given by The expressions e1 is t1 plus dot 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 plus tn. e2 is the sum i less than j, ti, tj, and so on and so forth. Just as we wrote for our um, for our um, roots of uh, relationship between roots and coefficients, ei should be the sum uh, j1 less than dot 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 less than ji, tj1 dot dot dot, dot tji and so on, as we wrote down before, all the way down, of course, to en is the product of all the t's. So that'll be how we'll write the elementary symmetric polynomials. And of course, they're often written as e1s of t, so we'll write, them, and so on, write them as e1, ei, as ei of the various t's as variables. Um, so, um, so what we want to do is just to restate the result that um, the, um, that, that we can restate uh, Vieta's result as saying that um, the uh, coefficients of split polynomial are the of uh, in one variable are the um, elementary symmetric uh, symmetric polynomials of the roots. Okay, so that's our elementary symmetric.
polynomials. Um, and the proof is pretty clear from just looking at the examples how these things work out. I won't give a more detailed proof. There is one, of course, in the notes. Um, so these are the elementary symmetric polynomials. What are the non-elementary symmetric polynomials? Um, a symmetric polynomial uh, is a polynomial in many variables. Um, some polynomial f of t dot 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 t1 dot dot tn, which is um, unchanged by permuting the variables. Any permutation of the variables, the t1 to tn. And so the elementary symmetrics are obviously that way because they really depend on um, their, their coefficients calculated from the roots. You take the roots of the polynomial and you calculate the coefficients. But if you change the order of the roots, it's still the same polynomial. It still has the same roots, so it still has the same um, coefficients. And so we can see that the elementary symmetrics must be invariant under permutations. And of course, they, they, they're sort of obvious when you write them out. E1, the first elementary symmetric polynomial, is just the sum of the roots. And then, so it's clear that if you change the order, it's still, you still get the sum the same. Um, so we want to sort of make an abstract polynomial with the given roots. Um, well, let's let, let's let pt of x be um, x minus t1, x minus t2, dot, 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 x minus tn, where I'm writing here t to mean all the t variables put together into one vector, and x, of course, just a single variable. So that's going to be a polynomial of a single variable x with these t's, and those will be its roots. So similarly, since we've collected the x, the t's up into a into a um, into a vector, we'll collect the x's up. We'll let e of t be e1 of t dot 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 e n of t, the elementary symmetric polynomials put into into a vector. So we we conclude um, something sort of obvious about these things because they they're given by taking the the roots and computing out the coefficients. The following. Um, Elementary fact, um, which is that if uh, for any, let's see, for any vector, uh, so C is a vector of entries over any field. If we take um, uh, the elementary symmetrics, there is a, a vector R, let's say is R1 a vector of possible roots over a finite um, field extension, maybe not in the given uh, the given um, field, but in maybe so after we take some extension, um, so that uh, E of R is C. Um, what does that mean? These should be the roots, and those should be the coefficients. So they're called C for coefficients, R for roots. And the proof is, is just almost obvious that you uh, you let p of x be the polynomial with those coefficients, x to the n minus c1x to the n minus 1, plus c2x to the n minus 2, da, 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 plus minus 1 to the n, cn, the obvious polynomial. And then, of course, um, what you're looking for is uh, it has roots in, you know, in a splitting field. So you just split it until you, you get your roots out. And then, um, then of course, PR of X has the same roots as little p of X. Um, and both mon, they're monic. Uh, that's monic and that's monic. So they have the same, same coefficients. And that's the proof. So then an, an another uh, trivial observation about these things is that um, if we look at for some kind of relationship, there's no uh, non-constant polynomial equation. Um, no non-constant polynomial equation. Let's say zero equals polynomial of um, uh, of the e's of t's. Um, the various e functions or v polynomials don't don't satisfy any relationship over any field. And the proof is that um, they would have to be the the coefficients of some of some arbitrary polynomial. So if they did, um, 
uh, if you had such a relationship, then after finite extension, after finite field extension, uh, you get, um, you can solve uh, E of R equals C for each C. Well, for each C there is a field extension. Um, so uh, that relationship would have to hold that uh, H of C would have to be zero for every C, for every vector C. Um, Oh, it should say this is over any. This is not over any field. This is over only, only over an infinite field, and we sort of start thinking about the difference between finite and infinite fields. Um, and uh, so we'd have this this relationship hold for all values of the variables, and um, and then uh, that's a contradiction over an infinite field, uh, because uh, a relationship that's satisfied for every input over an infinite field um, forces the uh, the relationship to be a zero polynomial, as we'll see. So, okay, so that's the um, uh, okay, so so that that shows that there's no relationship among the e's. There's some sense independent. So part of the power of these e's, these elementary symmetric polynomials, is that we can use them to tell if things are permutations of one another. So we have the following lemma that if we have two vectors, say s is s1 to s n, and t is t1 to tn, maybe the names aren't very good, those are supposed to be constant, vectors of constants over a field. I've used t's for variables already, so maybe I should have called that something else. Um, they are, anyway, those are constants over some field, um, and they are permutations of one another if and only if uh, they have the same e values, e of s is e of t, so I can tell whether or not they're just permuted. Um, and uh, and the the reason, the proof is that um, they they would be these e's would be the coefficients, e of s equals e of t. Um, these would be the coefficients of. So we can ask whether or not those are equal, but those are the coefficients of the polynomials p s of x and p t of x. So if they're equal, then those pol those polynomials are the same. Um, but then the roots are the same, so if they're 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 uh, the same polynomials. They're the same roots, um, so that would tell us that they'd have the same roots. And if they have the same roots, that would tell us that s equals t up to permutation. So um, up to permutation. So that would that would get yes the one direction. Then we could reverse the, reverse the argument the other way around. So I want to think about um, the problem of determining whether um, some polynomials uh, can be expressed, how, how or how some, some symmetric polynomials can be expressed in terms of the elementary symmetrics. So let's write down a polynomial f is 3x squared yz plus 3x y squared z plus 3xyz squared plus 5xy plus 5xz plus 5yz. And we can see that that's symmetric. If you swap the rules of the x's, the y's, the z's, it's, it's the same. I, I, I've been writing my, my polynomials up till now in t1 to tn as the abstract variables, but it's much easier somehow to read without using subscripts. x, y, z is a little bit easier to read than t1, t2, t3. So I'll write them in x, y's, and z's. So how do we, um, how do we, ref how do we factor this? I can see already here that it looks pretty, pretty close to x, y, x, z, y, z, which I recognize as e2. Um, it's expanded out in x's, y's, and z's instead of t1, t2, t3. And so it looks like f is, this guy should be, uh, well, I don't know what this is, x squared yz plus xy squared z plus 3xyz squared. That's certainly not an elementary symmetric polynomial there. But the fives are. The fives are actually five times this, this, this is just e2 of xyz. I'll just write it as e2, but e2 of, of the variables that I'm working with, which are x, y, and z in this case, instead of t1 to tn. Um, so you can see how to factor out an e2 in there. But what, what do you do with this? What you do is simply recognize that it has a common factor. All these guys have an x in them. They all have a y and they all have a z in them. So I can factor out a 3 from all of them, but I can also factor an x 
a y, a z. And once I factor out the x, a y, and z, I bring the number of x's down from 2 to 1, because I've already used 1 here. I've used 1 y and 1 z, and so I get an x and a y and a z. Plus this guy was 5 e2. I'll just write it as e2. So this is clearly recognizable as 3. This is e3, the product of 3 of the guys. Um, and this is the sums of products of one at a time, just 1x, 1y, 1z. That's just e1. So it's 3 uh, e3, e1, plus 5 e2. So that's how we can factor it. Now what would you do in general? What's the general technique um, for, for um, trying to find these factors? Uh, trying to factor things into, so if I have some some uh, symmetric polynomial, how do I factor it into elementary symmetrics? And the, the method is fairly easy. Um, what you try to do is to is to pull out, well, in some cases you see an obvious one like this one, but when you don't see anything obvious, you try and factor out uh, as much as you can from, uh, you take a term and try and factor out uh, from, the sim from terms that have similar um, similar coefficient, and try and see if you can get a common factor, and uh, which will be symmetric or low, at least lower degree thing, and, and keep going, um, finding these uh, these simpler expressions, which you know, hopefully themselves are which themselves are symmetric, and which uh, which hopefully you can express in terms of the e's. So um, so what we want to do is to make that into a general sort of method. Um, We'll, uh, we'll take, again, our variables. To, so we want to do this in all, all numbers of variables, call them t1 to tn. And if I have integers a1 to an, uh, non-negative integers, then what I'll do is I'll write t to the, t to the a to mean t1 to the a1 dot dot. So that's the definition of t to the a, which we actually used before. Um, t1 to the a1 dot 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 tn to the a n. It's convenient notation. Um, now, um, the weight uh, of um, of a term um, is the alphabetical ordering um, of the of the terms. Um, so, um, uh, it's, in other words, the weight is is defined by saying that uh, we'll, we'll say that the weight of a term is just is just this exponent. But we want to say that some weights are bigger than others. Um, so the weight is just of of t to the a is a. But what we want to alphabetically order so what do I mean by alphabetically? I mean that uh, that by the by the um, by the t one um, coefficient, the t one term a one, and then um, use uh, the t two coefficient or t two power I should say not coefficient power um, t two power to break ties among t1 powers, and so on. Um, use the t3 uh, to break ties among t1 and t2, and so on and so forth. So let, let's just see how we do it. It's easier to, to, to actually do it than it is to say how to do it. If we look at a t1 to the fifth, um, t2 to the third term, that has higher weight. What really matters is whether the weight is higher or not. Higher weight than any of um, t1 to the 3, t2 to the 5. You do it in the other order because you take the t1 coefficient first, and that's a bigger t1 coefficient, so it wins. Um, or what about t1 to the 5th, uh, t2 squared? Well, that has the same t1, so you have to look at the t2s to decide, and then the t2, this one wins because it has more t2s. And also, if we did t2 to the thousandth power, this still wins because we look at t1s first and then we look at t2s. So there's, this one has more t1s in it than that, so it wins. So now count the number of t1s first and see if which one wins and then if it doesn't tell you, go to the t2s and so on and so forth. So that's how we can decide. So let's, uh, as an example, look at the highest weight terms in E1. Um, E1 is the sum of the t1s plus t2s plus da 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 but it's the, the, the t1 is the highest weight term in E1. E2 is the sum of the T1, T2, plus T1, T3, plus dot, 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 dot. But it, this is the highest term. All the other terms are lower terms because they have, they either have the same amount of T1 and, 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 and worse uh, in, in, the, in the, the next, the no T2, or else they have uh, no T1, and so they're, they're, they're lower weight. So these are the highest weight terms. E3 has highest weight term, uh, has T1, T2, T3, plus lower weight terms. 
And remember that the products in the E's are all distinct. You don't get a T1 squared. You only get T1, T2, T3. Once you use up the T1, you're not able to use it again. And so that, those are our highest weight terms, dot, 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 dot. And EN has high, has weight term, well, it has only one term. It's the whole term. Okay, so those are our highest weight terms of each of the E's. So let's look at an example, again, of a, of a symmetric um, polynomial and see what we could do with it. Um, let's start off with, um, so as an example, we'll just take f of x, y, z. Again, I prefer letters rather than t1, t2, and so on when I'm writing examples out. But you could call that t1, t2, t3 if you wanted. So this guy's going to have 16x's, 9y's, and 7z's plus worse terms than that. Okay, so um, so that'll be our. Uh, the, so we'll assume we're, we're, we'll just write down the highest highest weight term, and then the lower weight terms. Now, what are we going to do with this thing? We simply look at its highest weight term. We don't have to look at the other terms. Um, we just can already see that everybody here's got at least seven uh, of everything. We put we put the highest weight, then the next, and so on. So we've ordered it by picking as much x as possible. Everybody else here has lower x, or the same amount of x and lower y, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so what have we got? Well, this means that we, our terms have to have um, at least seven of everybody because there's seven z's. So we can write them as x to the 16 minus 7, y to the 9 minus 7, and then x to the 7 minus 7, which is no x's, and then factor out 7 from everybody x, y, z. 7 plus other terms. Um, and similarly, uh, now let's simplify that. Um, so that's x to the 9, y to the 2, and then x, y, z to the 7 plus the dot. Now there's at least two, there's two y's here, and there's two x's here, so there's at least two in everybody here, so we'll factor those two out. So we've got x to the 9 minus 2 times, we'll take all, the, all two y's, and we get x, y to the 2, x, y, z to the 7, plus da, 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 da. So what have we got? Simplifying, we've got x to the 7, x, y to the 2, and then x, y, z to the 7, and then lower, lower terms, uh, lower weight terms. So these are the, 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 this is just the highest weight term, and we've computed out for it how to decompose it into, into these pieces, uh, how much x, y, z it has, how much x, y, and how much x. And what we're going to notice, though, is that, of course, E1 uh, is x plus y plus z. So, it's, so we could just say that it's x plus lower order terms. E2 is x, y plus lower order terms, or lower weight terms. And then E3 is x, y, z. Exactly. So that's going to look like E3. And so putting that in here, we get f is, um, well, this thing looks like an E3 um, to the 7. This one looks like an E2 squared, at least as far as the, 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 the highest weight term. It has the same highest weight as this, this has the same highest weight as this, and this has the same highest weight as E1 to the 7, and 6 of those, plus, and so on and so forth. And so I, if, if I take this and I, and I subtract it off from F, what I'll find is that I get, I get exactly this, this, this term get knocked out, and then, uh, then there's... there's um, uh, the remaining terms are of uh, of lower weights, so that gives that gives us a method to actually calculate these things. We just have to um, take the highest weight term. So as we did, to go back over it. We took the highest weight term and plus lower weight terms. Um, we only had to work out how much x y z it had in it. That's how much e three it has. Um, so how much x y z did it have in it? How much e, that's how much e three. And then once we've done that, how much x y that's how much e two and how much e one is what's left over. So um, and then after that, these two expressions clearly agree. These two ex agree exactly up to uh, lower weights. And so with that six becomes a six, and they have to agree up to lower weights. And so we keep going. And by induction, we can somehow work out what the lower weights should be. Okay, so I won't even write down the, the theorem, which is that this can always be done, that you can do this over any commutative ring. You can always do this process. So I won't uh, need to write that out for you. Um, it's, again, written in the notes uh, in detail. So, uh, so that gives us uh, the ability to carry out these kind of calculations, and we want to think more theoretically now about some of the examples that have come up in uh, lots of computations. Um, over the ma over many many years, that we look at the sums of powers. These are, are particular uh, symmetric polynomials that arise a lot. These are the the powers p j of 
t. Again, t is going to be abstract variables t1 to tn. And pj of t is t1 to the j plus t2 to the j plus da, 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 plus tn to the j. Um, this is, uh, so for example, p1 of t is just the sum of the t's. And we know that's also called e1 of t. Um, p2 of t, however, is not so easily related to e2. It's t1 squared plus t2 squared plus dot 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 plus tn squared, and so on and so forth. And um, so we have the following uh, result, which is um, relates the e's and the p's. So we've got these p's, which are not the same as the e's. Oh, the first one is the same, but after that, they're all different. Um, and then we've got these e's. And how are they related? And it's possible to calculate each in terms of the other. They're related. This is the result of Isaac Newton. Um, that uh, th that well, we have e1 and p1 are exactly the same as we said. After that, it's more complicated. 2e2 minus p1e1 plus p2 uh, is 0, and so on and so on and so forth. You get this expression 0 is, um, is uh, k e k minus p1 e k minus 1 plus p2 e k minus 2 Da, 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 and so on and so forth, going all the way down to uh, plus minus one to the uh, to the uh, what am I doing? K minus one, P K minus one, E one plus finally minus one to the K uh, P K, where I think of E zero as being one. Oh, all right, so this so this should be times here. Um, okay, so then uh, so that's that's an expression that I don't want to prove. Um, the proof is just that it is, 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 is a fairly long induction, which is given in detail in the notes. I don't think it would help you too much to, to watch me write it all out. Um, but, uh, but it does give you some, some idea that there is a, a way to calculate. Um, we can see how to calculate E's in terms of P's. If you had the P's, you have P1, that gives you E1, P2, and there's e, E1 we've already got, and that gives you E2, and so on. And in fact, you can do it the other way around. Given E1, you get P1, given E1 and E2. Now that you've got P1, you get P2, and so on and so forth. So you can calculate each from the other. It's not very straightforward to do, but in principle, it's all there. There's a powerful application of all this, of all this theory. Um, we'll look at the invariance of a square matrix. What are the invariants of a square matrix? What do I mean by invariants? We're interested in um, in rational functions. So the invariants of a square matrix, the rational functions f of a of the entries. So it, it's not really a function of the matrix so much. It'll write it this way, but it really means it's a rational function of the entries. So it's really f of a11, one, one, da, 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 a and n of a square matrix A, um, uh, which presumably has, um, so it says n by n, with entries in some ring or something like this, presumably a commutative ring, or in mark, we're mostly interested in the field, um, so that when you change um, the matrix by from A to F, A, F inverse, you get the same result as A. And uh, for any invertible matrix F over the same field or whatever we're doing. Um, so, so we'll do this over some field and, and we'll try and make this work for any, in, for any of these guys. Now, why would you do that? You, you, you remember that uh, when you change basis, uh, this is a, how a change of basis matrix uh, changes a ma changes a matrix A. We put it in a new basis. It changes like this. And so what we're asking for is a function that doesn't depend on which basis we compute in. So it's really a function that's that 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 has an invariant meaning, uh, independent of any particular choice of basis. So that's why we'd care about this question. We can come up with some simple examples of these kinds of objects. Um, You'll recall if we have, uh, so again, our matrix is some n by n, some square matrix over some field. You recall that the characteristic polynomial is this, uh, or maybe it's 
it depends on who you learned it from, the up to up to sign. It's either this or the other way around. Some, some maybe the sign's the other way around, but it doesn't really matter for us. Um, and it's traditionally written something like chi a of lambda or maybe p a of lambda. It's called the characteristic polynomial. And that's something you learned about in linear algebra to calculate the characteristic polynomial. But it's a polynomial depending on the entries of the matrix A. And so it's uh, it can be expanded out as a polynomial. Um, and we'll give the names, uh, which which hopefully will be easy to remember because they're similar to the names we've already used for the um, for the various entries of this polynomial. It's a polynomial lambda, so we've got to write out that's a constant term in lambda. And then there's going to be minus um, this one's called there's something called en minus one lambda, the linear term in lambda, plus da 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 da, da um, plus minus one to the n minus one e one of a lambda to the n minus one, and then finally plus minus one to the n lambda to the n. Okay, so there's no there's no a e term here because this is going to be exactly minus one to the n times lambda to the n. You can see by looking here at you'd set a to zero, you'd get determined minus minus lambda identity, which is exactly this term here. So the term with no a's in it. So you can see that there are going to be some coefficients in front of the in the characteristic polynomials, which are some expressions here some e n and so on and so forth and they've got, they've got these names for a good reason um, these are called the e1 of a to the e n of a are called the um, uh, the adver the symmetric um, the elementary uh, symmetric um, polynomials in the eigenvalues and we'll see that that's what they are. Well, actually, it's fairly easy to see what that's what they are. Uh, easy linear algebra. Um, in other words, if, if if you don't know a, but you only know its eigenvalues, you can plug into the usual elementary symmetric polynomial those eigenvalues of a instead of plugging in the matrix all the entries of the matrix a. Just plug its eigenvalues into the elementary symmetric polynomial, um, and that'll give you these. Well, we know that's true because we know the characteristic polynomial only depends on the on the eigenvalues of a. Um, so it really doesn't know anything about a except its eigenvalues, um, and so that so that has to be that, that these have to be elementary symmetric functions in the eigenvalues. You know the roots of the characteristic polynomial are exactly the eigenvalues, um, roots of, uh, but more or less by definition of eigenvalue of this guy, are the eigenvalues, and if those are the the roots um, uh, of the the roots of the characteristic polynomial are the eigenvalues, then um, then it's immediate that um, that the uh, that the uh, coefficients. If we know uh, the roots, we know the coefficients are just the elementary symmetric functions of the roots, and that means these must be the elementary symmetric functions of the eigenvalues. But then the way we've written it here, you can see that they must be invariant, um, var invariant, uh, um, uh, variants of the of the matrix A. The reason they're invariants of the matrix A is because um, if you alter A by a change of basis, you don't alter its characteristic polynomial, which you've already seen before in linear algebra. Now, um, there's another approach to constructing invariants, right, which is less abstract than constructing the characteristic polynomial. Another way to construct invariants would be simply to construct the uh, the powers. So another way, another example for constructing invariants would be just to say, let's, let's let, well, the, we're called the trace of a, of a matrix. A is the sum of its diagonal entries, A11, A22, plus dot, 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 plus ANN. I'm writing my matrices as A having entries AIJ, row I, column J, entry is, is capital AIJ, just for simplicity of notation, just to, so the, um, so this is called the trace. Uh, this quantity is called the trace of a matrix, and I won't prove that it's an invariant. It is proven in many linear algebra courses. I won't, I won't worry about that. It's an invariant, so that's the trace, and it is invariant. Um, so uh, that's the trace, and it's invariant. Okay. So, um, so then, if that's an invariant, then of course some, another obvious invariant would be to let P K of A be defined to be simply the trace of the kth power of A. And that makes an obvious invariant because if trace is invariant, then this is this is obviously invariant because you you change basis by on f by or on a by putting these f's and f inverses in, and then they all fall out of the trace. So it's easy to see that this would be invariant. So this has to be an invariant polynomial. So these are there's a collection of variant polynomials: some p1 of a dot 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 pn of a. And we can see if a were diagonal, um, if we took a diagonal. 
then we could immediately see that P uh, K of A is exactly the um, the power function that we've defined before, but calculated on the eigenvalues, or if it's diagonalizable, let's say, um, then this has to be calculated on the eigenvalues, the lambda i or the eigenvalues. The reason that's true is that um, it's simply, this becomes a diagonal matrix. So imagine it's diagonal, take its kth power, that's just the eigenvalues going down the diagonal to kth power, and it traces the sum of those. A more sophisticated example of, of, of computing some invariant of a, of, of a squared matrix, we can start by taking the characteristic polynomial of, of the matrix, which remember was determinant of a minus lambda identity the way I've set it up. It doesn't necessarily agree with the way you learned it in linear algebra, which might be the other, the other way around, lambda identity minus a. It doesn't matter for us. Um, let's let delta a, the discriminant, be the discri discriminant of uh, the characteristic polynomial of, of a. So that's the resultant, by definition, the discriminant is the resultant of the characteristic polynomial and its derivative in the lambda variable. So it's a polynomial lambda, it's differentiate, get a polynomial lambda. And then that's an invariant of the matrix. And it's, uh, it's not hard to see that it's an invariant polynomial because um, we calculated out the, the um, coefficients of this guy in terms of the entries of A, or polynomial in the entries of A. And then if you differentiate lambda, you get just this, again, polynomial in the entries of A. Um, but what does it mean? Um, so the discriminant, um, discriminant of A is 0 exactly when, the discriminant of, of a polynomial is 0 exactly when um, it has uh, multiple roots in some field extension. So we've seen that um, that before. Multiple roots in some field, some finite field extension. But um, but having multiple roots in that in that field extension means the the roots are the eigenvalues. That's exactly a has uh, multiple eigenvalues. So it has a double eigenvalue. And on the other hand, if we go the other way around, we could say, well, if A no, it doesn't have any multiple eigenvalues, only single eigenvalues, then the discriminant must be non-zero. So a, a big theorem that we can get out of all this algebra, uh, this rather abstract algebra about symmetric polynomials, is that um, over any, any infinite field, again, we only need infinite field to make it work, um, uh, the rational functions um, every, well, as there are the invariant rational functions of a matrix um, are exactly uh, the rational functions of the elementary symmetric functions of the eigenvalues. So in particular, it depends, they depend only on the eigenvalues, which is not obvious. And we could, instead of using the elementary symmetric functions, we could also use the uh, sums of powers functions of the eigenvalues. Uh, that would be fine, too. So as our proof, um, we just take um, we take f of a, some invariant rational function, rational function, and um, and let's set a to be uh, a bunch of of quantities. Let's call them t1 to tn, so eigenvalues down the diagonal, and zeros out here. We'll call them t1 to tn. They can be from our field because it's an infinite field. They can be essentially treated as if they're variables, um, because vanishing in in an infinite field uh, is is vanishing. Um, so, um, so then we'll just set f of let f of t1 to tn be defined to be the expression, which is just f of a for this a a equal to this matrix, and that gives us some uh, some uh, function of some variables, and uh, we'll just write that also as f of t, where t is going to be the vector t1 to tn, and then um, then if we take capital F to be any uh, permutation matrix. Recall that there are 
matrices that swap the variables uh, in a vector, um, swap the entries. And then we have to have f of f a f inverse is equal to f of a because we said it was an invariant function, and the ra invariant rational function. And that implies, therefore, that, that this f of t1 to tn, if you, if you permute um, the, the um, we put use a permutation matrix here. You're permuting the inputs and outputs. You're permuting in one direction the uh, the inputs and the other direction the outputs. And so you're just reordering. So it's just a reordering of the of the of the the diagonal entries. Um, and that so that implies this thing's a reordering invariant. And so this is a symmetric uh, rational function. And so it can be somehow written in terms of the um, in terms of the eigenvalues. So it's somehow f of t is some polynomial of e of t, where e again is our is all of our e1, e2, and so on put into a vector. So this suggests for us that maybe we should replace um, our invariant function f of a, original invariant rational function of, of the matrix, by the function f of a minus h of e of a, where e of a again is the elementary symmetric functions of the eigenvalues of the matrix a. Um, and then, uh, so then, um, then we can guarantee that f of a is zero for a diagonal, because we got checked it. We've checked again that here is our a diagonal, and we've just uh, arranged that f equals h of e, and so f equals h of e on all the diagonal matrices. So um, uh, for a diagonal, okay. So for a diagonal, f of a is zero. But then uh, it's invariant, and so it's uh, f of a is zero for a because it's, and you can change basis. It's for a diagonalizable. So all the diagonalizable matrices um, have f equal to zero, and we want to show that that makes all the matrices have f equal to zero. Now we want to make sure that that f is actually everywhere zero, and so what we do is we consider we take some a naught uh, with um, with only uh, simple eigenvalues, no multiple eigenvalues. Uh, eigen, simple eigenvalues. Um, and um, and we can take any, uh, A not anything, any n by n matrix. We know that if, um, if delta of A is not zero, then A is diagonalizable. Has only simple eigenvalues. That implies it's diagonalizable, which I won't prove. Um, should should know hopefully from linear algebra. Um, if it has only that, say it's, it's only simple eigenvalues, so it's, it does no multiple eigenvalues, then it's diagonalizable. And then um, that implies that um, that f of a is zero. So uh, so now we can look at the polynomial. Look at um, f of. Uh, Let's say, uh, let's well, let's let a t be one minus t a naught plus t a one, and so at t equals zero it becomes a naught, t equals one it becomes a t. So we've a one a one. So we've got one with only simple eigenvalues and one with with any eigenvalues. And what we've got is that um, at t equals zero, we know that um, uh, delta a zero is not zero because it has only simple eigenvalues. So f of a0 zero is 0. Now consider the, consider the polynomial, which is t mapping to f of a t. Um, and that's uh, going to be uh, is 0 at t equals 0. Um, but it's, uh, it's um, uh, let's see. So uh, what we want to show is that it's 0 everywhere. So, so we we can also look at the polynomial t goes to delta a t. Again, that's a polynomial in t, and it's zero. It's um, not zero at t equals zero, and therefore, since it's not zero somewhere, and it's a polynomial of one variable t, and so it's not zero at all but finitely many. Has finitely many roots, and it's all but finitely many uh, values of t. But if it's not zero somewhere, we've said that um, that if it's not zero somewhere, then f is zero there. So that f of a t 
is zero at all, but finitely many uh, t. But there's an infinite field, so there are infinitely many t's, and uh, and it's got to be vanishing for all but finitely many of them. So it has infinitely many roots, uh, roots in t, and that implies that it's actually everywhere zero. A polynomial with infinitely many roots uh, has to be zero everywhere because it has infinite degree. So it's everywhere zero. Therefore, f of a t is zero for all t, and that implies that f of this a one was zero. And that implies that that we found that f vanished everywhere, and so it has to actually be um, be everywhere zero. That shows that it has an expression in the elementary symmetric uh, polynomials as the zero polynomial. We want to have one more application besides thinking about invariance of of, of matrices. Let's think about equations and and their resultants. Um, and how that relates to permuting of roots. Um, so something about resultants and permutations. Let's look at a simple example. We take some b of xy to equal x squared plus y squared minus 1 and c of xy to be x squared plus y minus 1 squared minus 1. Um, and they'll do this over the real numbers, let's say. Um, so in a picture, um, b looks the solutions of, of that equation, x squared plus y squared equals 1, um, are a circle. And the solutions of this equation are the same circle, but lifted up um, by one unit. Not very well drawn, but that's the idea. So um, so this is, uh, this is b equals 0, and this is c equals 0, c equals 0. And they, uh, we can see that, that the two points at which they intersect are on this line here. Let's look at the resultant. The resultant in x, so we re do result in an x variable of b of x, y, and c of x, y. What does that mean? It means that we treat y, we treat as rational functions of y, so uh, we think of them as if they were rational in y, and polynomial in x, and we compute out the result in this polynomials in x. So um, so what does that give us? Um, so it's it's then, uh, then, if they're rational functions in y, the result is a rational function of y, it's some r of y. Uh, and uh, and if you actually compute it out, I'll leave you to check. We know how to do resultants. We have a, an explicit uh, algorithm in terms of writing out matrices of coefficients. So uh, so you turn out to get this guy, and you can see what's happening here. It's a two y minus one, and so it's equal to zero exactly at y equals one half. And where would y equals one half come in? Well, it's exactly what we've drawn here. This line here. This is exactly y equals one half and that's where the roots are that's where that's where the, the two curves this curve and this curve intersect along this line y equals a half so you can see where that's coming from and um, and and we'll see that that's that's makes sense more generally but if you just plug in y equals a half you get b of x and a half uh, you can compute out what it is um, it's x uh, x squared plus y squared minus one so plus a half squared is a quarter minus one and if you uh, factor that, that's x minus root 3 over 2, x plus root 3 over 2, so it breaks into two factors. And then c of x and 1 half is um, x squared again, it's plus a quarter minus 1, and so it's exactly the same factors. Okay, so, but what does it really telling us? What we're finding is that, in fact, um, this resultant vanishes um, because there's a common factor. That's what resultant tells us. It tells us when b and c have a common factor, which values of y would make these polynomials in x have a common factor. But having a common factor over, let's say, at least over the complex numbers, and in this case, even over the real numbers, turns out to be uh, to, to mean having a common root. And that's when, when as we can find the values of y, there's a resultant vanishes, which are the values of y where it's possible for there to be uh, common roots, in other words, for there to be uh, intersection points of the, of, of the curve c equals 0 and c of curve b equals 0. Let's for the moment go back to think about one variable polynomials. Um, and um, see, suppose we have uh, polynomials in x, x minus beta 1, and I'll let the betas be the roots. So we suppose we actually knew the roots somehow of this b, and we wrote them out, wrote out b factored, it's a mnemonic polynomial, and one variable x. And this guy, we also know its roots. If we knew the roots, we said before that the resultant could be calculated 
um, by just multiple or by just multiplying the differences of roots gamma one minus beta one, gamma one minus beta two da, 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 dot all the way to gamma n minus beta m. And what's important here for us is that, therefore, this thing becomes a polynomial of a certain degree. There are how many of these factors multiplied together? There are m n of them for every choice of the beta and every choice of the gamma. You have a factor. So there are m n factors here of, of um, gamma, gammas minus betas overall. Um, so it's a polynomial of degree um, m n in the betas and gammas. So um, what we're curious about is then how, co how does that relate to the coefficients? Because if we didn't know how to factor it like this, if we didn't know how to factor either of them, we could still express the result in terms of coefficients. But what would be the relationship between the resultants, the relationship in coefficients, and the relationship between it, well, and, and its, its expression in roots? So if we, if we think about it in terms of coefficients, we know that b of x as a polynomial, according to our general Vieta theory, is um, it's going to express itself as elementary symmetric functions da, 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 dot all the way down to minus one to the m e m of betas. So we go higher and higher up the e's as we go lower and lower down the numbers of x's. And the same thing with the c's, x to the n minus e one of the roots of c. Uh, this should be n minus one plus da, 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 dot minus one to the n times e n of the gammas. So that's how we could write the relationship between the, the, the roots and the, and the coefficients. So we had the roots up here, and we calculate out the coefficients in terms of the roots. So um, note that each e j of beta is degree j in betas in the various roots beta. Now, suppose we don't know the, the betas and the gammas. As I said, we, we, we might imagine that we don't know them, that we just know that we have some coefficients, some xm plus some bm minus 1, uh, x to the m minus 1, da 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 da, down to some um, b naught, and we have some c of x, with, which is just some polynomial with some coefficients. We'll assume they're both monic to make it easier. Um, so we have some polynomial with some coefficients. How do we figure out um, uh, how to talk about the resultant? We've, we've written here a formula for resultant, very nice formula for resultant in terms of the roots, but we'd really like to understand the relationship of the resultant and the coefficients. These are our coefficients rather than roots, because often we face a polynomial where we have the coefficients, so we don't know what the roots are. Um, so what we're naturally led to uh, to think about is because each coefficient is of degree j in the betas, we want to say we define um, the weight, we're using the word weight differently here, of each bj is to be uh, defined to be j. So that um, this guy will be thought of as having, um, sorry, is n, not j, is m minus j. Sorry, to fix that I should probably, yeah, probably change these, make that b1, this be bm, this will be c1, this will be cn. That way our m and n will match with our coefficients of our e's. Okay, so the degree of beta j is j. Uh, and Sorry, the weight. And, and the weight actually is, of course, the degree. Um, so it's equal to the degree in betas um, uh, over the splitting field when we split. If we split the polynomial, then it does have these betas, they start to exist, these roots come into being, and then the degree and the weight are the same. It's just, just another word for degree. But when we don't know anything about the betas, if you have a polynomial for which you don't know the betas, you still know the bj's, you know its coefficients, not its roots, it still has well-defined weight. And we, ex we extend this definition to the obvious. Um, uh, we have, have a monomial in, uh, in beta j's, in, sorry, not beta j's, in bj's, Take any monomial in the bj's, and you define its weight um, uh, as the sum of the weights of each individual uh, powers, and so on. So, so if you write, we multiply bj's together, you get a, a notion of weight. So we can then define the weight of um, of any polynomial in the bj's. Um, and we'd simply define it exactly as you'd expect, that the weight of the polynomial of bj's is exactly given by taking the, the largest um, weight of any, of any monomial 
and uh, the weight in the monomials are just the, just the sums of the weights in the individual BJs. That way, the degree, uh, when you do split the thing, if, we, if it does split, its degree in the betas will be exactly its weight. So, um, so you maybe write that down. So um, if B of X splits over some given field, then uh, weight of any polynomial in the BJs in its coefficients is degree in the betas. And so what we have is the obvious fact that the resultant must therefore have um, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of fact that you'd probably guess at this point, which is that lemma that the resultant of the B of X, uh, C of X, is, uh, well, has every term in the B's, uh, BJ's, and CJ's, the coefficients of weight all the same, M times N. And, and that's just from expanding out. Uh, so the proof is just to split. Um, split them both into these, uh, having these roots, these betas and these gammas, and you expand everything out. And we know that every single term was uh, in, in the result was, a, was mn degree in these betas and gammas because they were, it was expressed as a product of, of gammas minus betas. Um, and so we know exactly that all the terms turn out to be mn's. Um, but it could somehow be expressed in terms of the coefficients. After all, the computation of the result is not done by, by finding the roots. It's done by actually using the coefficients of the polynomial. So it's expressible in the coefficients, and as the coefficients, it must be um, a polynomial of exactly the, this weight mn. From this, we get um, a, a fairly straightforward result, um, but now we're going to allow two variables instead of one. So suppose that b of xy and c of xy are um, uh, degrees m, m, and n, respectively, over a field. And then um, we'll suppose that, uh, well, then, then, then two things could happen. Either one thing could happen is that um, there are, at most, m, n values of y for which um, there is a point um, x naught, let's say y equals y naught, uh, x y naught, for which it's possible to find an x y naught with um, 0 equals b of x naught y naught and also equals c of x naught y naught. So being on both curves, when we drew these, uh, these curves in the plane, we were saying we'd have some b equals zero, some c equals zero curves, and we want to know how many times do they do they intersect, and we count how many y's there can be for which there's there's a point of intersection. Um, either that, uh, oh, and result vanishes there. The resultant um, uh, vanishes there. That's um, well, which was this r of y. I said the resultant in x is an is a, is a rational function of y, a polynomial in y and it vanishes there. Or um, the other possibility is that um, they have a positive degree common factor um, have positive degree common factor um, as, uh, as a polynomial in xy. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. Either there's going to be a common factor, or else we're going to be able to count out all these different different y's for which there could be an x where they intersect. And and I want to say that um, if b of x y and c of x y are homogeneous, um, then um, the factor fa the factor that we've predicted to exist is also uh, homogeneous. And, and the resultant is homogeneous, is also homogeneous, okay, of degree exactly mn. And the proof is, at this point, quite elementary. Um, so um, so the, the proof is, is obviously that we know the degree um, of the resultant in y. Um, we know it's at most mn. 
Um, and uh, that's because, of course, it's just given by the weights, um, by by having the weights all be mn's, um, in in the in of course in our given variable x, um, and uh, and we also know that the weights exactly reach mn exactly reach um, the this maximum mn exactly when when every single factor uh, doesn't drop down, and so uh, so in the homogeneous case it'll exactly match. So the resultant will vanish when there's a common factor. Um, so if, for example, at um, y equals y naught, we'd be looking at a common factor between b of x y naught and c of x y naught. So if there's no common factor, there's clearly no common root. But if there is a common factor, then of course there's a common root at least over some some extension of the field, some finite field extension. So either the result's everywhere zero, or, um, or 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 there are only m n such values at most. And if there are, uh, if if the reach that uh, that if, if it's more than m n, then then you have um, uh, then you have the resultant everywhere zero. And the resultant everywhere zero means you'd have a common factor with coefficients which are rational. Um, so resultant is everywhere zero. That's exactly that. There's a common factor. But it's it w well. It's in. Um, it's in. Um, it's, sorry. It's it's in b of, b of x uh, c of x um, b of x y not c of x y not. Um, but uh, uh, it, that's as. Um, as as rational functions in y polynomial in x, and um, and then we can just apply the Gauss lemma to get us back to polynomials in x and y having a common factor polynomial. For the um, the case of homogeneous um, polynomials, uh, every um, b j uh, of y factor, if we think of b of x y. As a sum of coefficients, which are rational y times the powers of x, this guy is uh, is of degree. Either vanishes or it's exactly degree uh, j. Oh, sorry, it's directly. What am I saying? M minus j, and so you get exactly um, that it occurs uh, in in the in the in the resultant um, with exactly degree. Um, so the resultant has exactly degree exactly m n, or vanishes everywhere. In the next lecture, we'll talk more about the structure of rings.